Raul gives his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage, and then Moses is just simply content to stay out here and work for his father-in-law. He takes care of his herds of flocks. Chapter 3 tells us that while he's tending Raul's flocks, Moses drives them to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Wait a minute, you say. You thought that the holy mountain was Sinai. Here it's called Mount Horeb. This is what the Elohist calls Mount, uh, Mount Sinai. Right? We've got these different accounts here. One calls it Mount Sinai, the other calls it Mount Horeb. So here in chapter 3, we are reading the Elohist uh, uh, tradition, right? Okay, and it says right here, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The mountain of God. This is where he is going to encounter God. I think it's really important, the text gets really important right here. To begin with, God attracts Moses' attention by presiding in a burning bush. This gets Moses' attention, but even more important, God calls out to Moses, right? God calls Moses. This is really important. God chooses Moses. He says, Moses, Moses. He reaches out to Moses. This then legitimates in his power and authority to Moses. Moses then turns to the side, uh, and God re reveals his name to Moses. Uh, to clarify, he says, uh, let me see here, this is at verse 3, 6. Uh, 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 then God says, uh, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, this is what God says to Moses, <coughs> I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, right? I am the God of your father, right? I am the God of your fathers. God tells Moses that he has heard the sufferings and cries of the Israelites and that he will deliver them into a land of milk. That means lots of herds, right? They're going to have lots of sheep and lots of goats, a land of milk uh, and honey. And this is puzzling because it's not talking about bees and honeycombs. They made honey from grapes. Right, from grapes, and so it's a land flowing with lots of, of, of uh, furnished with lots of, of, of herds, of, of goats, and of sheep, and lots of vines as well. All right, uh, let me see. Yes, as a sign of my power and all that this is true, God tells Moses, You and my people will worship me again here on this mountain. This is why Moses wants to come back, right? Because he, God has told him, You're going to worship me, you and my people are going to worship me at Mount Horeb slash Mount Sinai. Okay, Moses, who perhaps knows these Israelites very well, says, you know, they're probably not going to believe me. Why should they come out of Egypt and out here into the desert? And Moses says, uh, uh, says to God, if my people ask, uh, who is this God, what shall I tell them? And now here it comes, right? Chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, God says to Moses, I am who I am. Right? I am who I am. I am the great being. This is what he's saying. Right? That the Hebrew reads, I am the great being. And it's a play on the Hebrew verb to be, to exist. Right? I am the great, I am the great being. And he says, thus you shall say to the Israelites, this is God, the Lord. And the, the text here uses now, and the, uh, this is interesting because the Elohim text changes from using uh, Elohim to Yahweh. Right? Yahweh. Right? He says, the Lord, Yahweh, I am the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I have, uh, sent, uh, I have sent you to them. In both of these verses, the name of God is related to the Hebrew verb, Hayat, meaning life, existence, to be life force. God is the great creator. He's the great essence. That's, that's how he is portraying himself right here. After God's name is revealed here in Exodus chapter 3, he is consistently referred to as Yahweh in the Torah. The priestly source adopts this name for God exclusively, whereas the Yahweh source has always used it beginning with chapter 2. So now we're all on the same page. They all agree that the God of the Hebrews, the God of the Israelites, is Yahweh. All right, any questions? Good stuff. Yeah. Really good stuff. All right, God, in chapter 3, again, tells Moses to return to Egypt and announce his presence to the Israelites. Tell the Israelites that God, uh, he, he, he is to tell the Israelites that God, that Yahweh, has heard their suffering and misery, and that he will bring them up out of Egypt into Canaan. This is a doubling. You need to know this because we've already gotten this information. <laughs> Once again, we have the Yahweh and the Elohim source being incorporated into the text right here. 
Uh, he is to tell Pharaoh that God has said to let his people go so that they may sacrifice to him. Pharaoh will refuse to do this, God says, and he, God, then will stretch out his mighty hand and perform wonders, after which Pharaoh will accede. Okay. So well, that's really interesting. Uh, we have Yahweh, and Yahweh is revealed. But you know, it comes from the Midianites may have been worshiping Yahweh, right? There's something to do with a holy mountain where Yahweh is located that is connected to the Midianites out here in the Sinai Peninsula. And this is where Moses then learns about Yahweh. This is where Moses learns about Yahweh. And this Yahweh then reveals himself, I am the same God of your forefathers, right? Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, right? And that God. Chapter 4 gets really interesting. Here we have the big, big hand and pen of that priestly source. Remember that source that has the final say in how the, the, the shape of the Torah? You can see it quite clearly. Why? Because the priestly source inserts Aaron right in the thick of things. Why does that matter? Because Aaron is a Levite, and these Levites in the post-exilic period, when they come back from the Babylonian captivity, insist that they can trace their lineage right back to Aaron and Aaron's sons, right? So why does it matter that Aaron is put in the thick of this? Because he's almost the equal of Moses. If you read this text carefully, you wonder what happened to Moses. <laughs> Here's what he did. Okay. The narrative up to this point has been mostly that of the Yahwist and the Elohist authors. Hereafter, however, the priestly writers will frequently work in passages into the Yahwist and Elohim texts <coughs> that highlight Aaron's role in the Exodus story. Chapter 4, verses 10 through 17, Moses demurs that the burden God has put upon him is too much. He says, well, I'm not an eloquent speaker. I really am not up to this. Well, at that point, 413, God arranges to have Moses' older brother Aaron, Aaron is three years older than him, act as his spokesperson. Aaron is also given miraculous powers nearly equivalent to those of Moses. Armed with this power, according to the priestly source, he will take a large role in causing the plagues to ravage Europe, or I should say Egypt. This emphasis upon Aaron as the companion and co-worker of Moses during the events leading up to the Exodus are aimed at legitimizing the large role of the Levites in a post-exilic world. The Levites, as I said, stress their lineage right back to Aaron, and the high priest must be directly from his line. All right. This is really interesting. You know, uh, if, if you get time uh, sometime in the next couple of days, you should turn to uh, Exodus chapter 3 or Exodus chapter 6 and look at this lineage. Uh, it's it's 613 uh, down through. Oh, where am I here? I'm sorry. It's 6. Uh, yeah, 613 down through 25. Uh, and it says the following are the heads of the ancestral houses. And in other words, you think you're going to get a, a lineage again, uh, all over again, of the, 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 the 12 sons of Jacob, but you don't get that at all. Uh, they give, uh, the, the, the priestly writers give uh, Reuben and his sons uh, the firstborn. Uh, they give the sons of Se uh, Simeon the secondborn. And they give the sons of Levi. And at that point, they focus upon Aaron and his progeny, and that's as far as they go. They don't even mention Moses, right? They don't even mention Moses. They are just stressing that Aaron goes all the way back and that Aaron was there at the time of the exile. So you can see the priestly hand in all of this. Uh, the other thing is, before we get done with this, uh, remember Moses now is making his way from Midian. God, uh, God tells him that uh, the old Pharaoh has died and you can go back and get my people. And so Moses is making his way out of the city of Peninsula and the text tells us that God sends Aaron to meet him, right? Sends Aaron to meet him out there in the desert, right? And remember, Aaron, like Moses, then has been called by God. He reaches down and says, Aaron, I want you to go. So there it is. He's, he's almost, probably this much lesser than Moses in this account. It's really interesting. Really interesting. Any questions? Okay, chapter 5. Moses tells Pharaoh, this is where Moses, Moses and Aaron begin to confront uh, Pharaoh, that God has demanded that he let the Israel, Israelites go free to worship him. Pharaoh scoffs at this command and scoffs at God. He refuses. And Pharaoh replies to Moses, this is really interesting, Who is the Lord that I should heed him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. 
Right? He scoffs at this God. Who is this God? I don't know this God. I'm not, I'm not afraid of this God. And so what Yahweh is going to do now over the next, <laughs> over, over the next uh, 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 a few weeks and a few months is to bring a series of calamities and a series of catastrophes down on the Egyptians to demonstrate to Pharaoh who he is. This is, this is at one point, this is what he says. I have done this to show Pharaoh who I am. Right? Who I am. As a matter of fact, he goes so far as to say, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that I can continue to demonstrate who I am, right? Okay. All right. Instead of letting the Israelites go to worship God at Mount Sinai, this Pharaoh increased the labor of the Israelites, and one of the things he does is he no longer provides them with brick, with, with uh, straw to mix into their uh, bricks so that the um, bricks will hold together. They have to go out and they have to get their own straw. So he's uh, the same labor but with more work. It right? increases their work. Chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 7 is uh, really important because here God reaffirms his covenant with the Israelites. And this is worth reading, okay? Um, God spoke to Moses. Now remember, he's back in Egypt. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. That is El Shaddai, right? That El Shaddai, that's, that's what's used here. But my name is Yahweh. My name is Yahweh, the Lord. I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they resided as aliens. I have also heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are holding as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant, right? I have remembered my covenant with your forebearers. This is what he's doing. He's reviving that covenant. Okay. Uh, say therefore to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians and deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my people, and I, I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has freed you from the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for possession. I am the Lord. Do you understand how powerful that would have been to these people living in Babylon? Right? Think about that, right? What, what, what Exodus is doing is reminding them we have been in this situation before, right? And we are God's people. God has made a covenant with our forebears, with our forefathers, with, the, with our, forebod, our forebears when they were in e Egypt. And God, we are still God's chosen people. Right? Yeah. This is powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. Where are you? Well, uh, in, in all this, I keep thinking it's not surprising to me anyway in one way or another. That there is no historical uh, uh, writing about this. Pharaoh was God himself. Yeah. And so why should he pay any attention to these people that were just getting him in trouble? You know, that's a good that's argument. That's not in, in, yeah. in their writing. Why should they well, write about that? That's a really good point, except uh, the, the counterpoint to that is that Egyptian writings are full of other people who lived in, in, in uh, Egypt at the time and in, in, in the other areas. It kept really but that, 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 that's one thing, that these other people didn't come and say, we, we have the right God, we have, we have the real God, when Pharaoh himself... Is a God. Yeah. Is a God. Yeah. He's considered a God. So I, I think that it's not surprising that we don't have any historical uh, evidence from this time in Egypt. Yeah, it's it's indirect. The evidence we have is indirect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, um, where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what right. I say. Where there's smoke, there's fire. There's there's we probably more than one kernel of truth under all of this. You know? <coughs> absolutely. All right. Uh, chapters 7 through 11, because uh, he's, uh, Pharaoh will not let these people go, uh, and I'm going to have to let you go here pretty soon. Uh, we, chapter 7 through 11 are the ten signs and wonders and plagues, and the significance of these plagues is manifold. First of all, and this, is, this comes through in the text, they are meant to demonstrate Yahweh's power. Right. They were meant to demonstrate because Pharaoh scoffs at this God. Who is this God? I don't know him. And Yahweh says, I am going to show not only Pharaoh, but all the Egyptians who I am. They are meant to have both Pharaoh and the Israelites recognize his power. And this is important if you think about the, the Jews being in Babylonia at the time. Right? Don't give up because God is so powerful. They show that the Israelites are God's people and that he is taking care of them. He has not forgotten their covenant. 
they will provide the Israelites with a sense of identity. And this is very important. They become the people of Yahweh. This is their identity. They worship Yahweh. Uh, they give the Jews in the post-exilic world a sense of hope and even control. That is, all is not lost. Yahweh is looking after us. By stressing the role of Aaron, and you will see this next week when we talk about the, uh, the various plagues, they give legitimacy and power to the Levite priesthood and post-exilic Judaism. Yehud is a uh, Persian province with no secular king or ruler, and the Levite priestly class and the high priest are asserting claims to dominate society religiously, politically, and socially. Okay, we will stop there. Uh, thank you for coming. We will take this up next week. Of course, we didn't get through, and we will push on.